Acts chapter number seven. And before I go on, this first verse kind of makes me have to go back to chapter six when they'd set up false witness against Stephen, remember? Trying to get him in trouble the same way they did Jesus, same way they always do. But here's chapter number seven. It says, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? All these false claims. And he said, Stephen, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. Charon, however you say that. And he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. So Stephen's standing up. He's basically giving them a history lesson of who they really are. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into, the, into this land wherein ye now dwell. He gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Remember, Abraham, when he went there, he never stayed in one spot. He just walked all the land, slept in tents. And, and, uh, but it was all promised to him. God told him to go walk the breadth and the width of the land and, you know, check it out, so to speak. And it says, uh, God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. So we know that's the when they was in bondage down in Egypt. Wasn't it? it says, And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge. Ten plagues. Said God, And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave, them, gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all of his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Go back and read in Genesis there when it's talking about Joseph. That's one of the best stories in the whole scripture. It says... Uh, God was with him and delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh. Okay, we just read that. Made him governor over Egypt and his house. He says, Now there came a dearth, famine, over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. They had no more. They was going to starve to death. And he says, uh, But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called, all, called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls, seventy-five for me and you. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in a sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emar, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred. Remember that word subtly? That kind of always makes me think of the serpent. He was more subtle than any beast of the field. So anytime you see that, you know somebody's up to some trickery. Dealt subtly with their kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young, to the end, they might not live. And he put the decree out to cure all the little Hebrew boys. And it says, In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh, remember they put him in the little ark of bulrushes and floated him down the river, and Pharaoh's daughter found him. It says, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him for her own son. And Moses was learning in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. <laughs> he was mighty in words and in deeds while he was an Egyptian. But you, you'll notice when you get to Moses and uh, God calls him to go back in there, one of his first excuses is he can't talk real good. You know, I'm a man of slow speech. Yet here he says he was mighty in words and deeds. So something happened to him, didn't it? 
says, And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And this is why he was still a prince in Egypt. And it came into his heart to go out. He found out he was a Hebrew. I don't know how long he knew, but he went out. It came to his heart to go out and see about him. And it says, He seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. So there's an Egyptian probably whipping him or something, and he kills the Egyptian. And it says, For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. That's a pretty important verse, because we, we just assume that Moses don't know nothing about this till he goes to the burning bush about being the deliverer and all that. But right here, it says, He, he supposed his brethren should have understood that God by his hand would deliver them. That was way back before he ever went to the desert. But they understood not, it said. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. Now there's two Hebrews striving together. And he says, it says, and would have set them at one again, says, sirs, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? So that guy saw him, didn't he? And that call that scared Moses. It says, He fled at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, he stayed out in the desert forty years, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So that whole thing, you see... In the Ten Commandments, it was an angel of the Lord that was in that bush speaking to him. And uh wouldn't doubt in every bit if it wasn't the voice of the Lord Jesus, since, you know, he was there too. Even before he was born in Bethlehem, he's always been. Anyways, it says, When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning and come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you into Egypt. Then Moses, when they refused, saying, who, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hands of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear. And of course, he's talking about Jesus. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Remember, you know, you read through that, they didn't care about Moses too much. The first chance, every time, the first chance they got, they tried to rebel against him. That's kind of what Stephen's going over here. He's, he's trying to show them a pattern of their stiff neck and their hard heart. It says, uh, saying unto Aaron, make us gods. This is what the, the children of Israel said. Said unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, who which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what, what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like Cain. Sounds like all of us. We always want that work of our own hands when it takes the work of God that actually gets, you know, stuff done. Anyway, it says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. He says, That's what you want. That's what you're going to. You'll notice in here. People usually get what they say. What's in their heart comes out of their mouth, and it usually comes to pass because that whole time in the wilderness, the 40 years, I'll, how many times you see them say, were there no graves in Egypt that we come out here to die? We come out here to die. We come out here. Guess what happened to them? They all died out there, exactly like the, like they said, except for the two that was faithful. And let that be a lesson to us all. He says, because uh, God gave them, he turned, gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, 
have offered to me slain beasts and sacrificed by the space of forty years in the wilderness. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rempham, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So you just see how these time and time again how they turn to other gods and worship them, the star of Rempham and Moloch and the Baal, all time about Baal, they just worship everything except the true God most of the time. It says, uh, Our fathers had the tabernacle of, wilderness, of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David." who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Remember, uh, if you've read through that, David, it was in his heart to build God. He was sitting up there in this big fancy house, and he's like, you know, the ark of God sitting down there in a the tent. I want to build you a house. But it fell upon Solomon to build the house because David's, David's life, even though he had the heart up for God, his life was just one big bloody tale. You know, he'd spilled so much blood and, and, and warfare and whatnot. So God let his, his son build that for him. And it says, Solomon built him a house. And howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as says the prophet. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? So God making a point, you know, how can you build me a house? I made it all. It says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So he, he showed them how the fathers did this whole time, this whole stuff. And they said, you're doing the same thing. You did it with Jesus. And before this chapter is over, you're going to see what becomes of Stephen. He says, uh, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it? They gave you the law, you've not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. You ever seen somebody get so mad that they're like, about ready to turn into the Hulk? That's what gnashing of teeth is. And it cut it, you know. Like I said before, sometimes when you get cut to the heart, it, it produces repentance. The last couple of times we've seen it here, it produces wickedness, doesn't it? Because they get stirred up in their heart and it just gets hard and they just keep doing the, the bad stuff. And that's what's happening here. It says, uh, but he, Stephen, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. You ever hear stories about people that's fixing to die that look up and see stuff? God kind of gives them a glance, a glimpse of the, the other realm. I've got a story like that. My grandma, Irene, when she died in the hospital bed, she just laid there and she was out of it for all. I wasn't there, but I've heard it many times. She was pretty much just out, ready to go. And then all of a sudden, she starts kind of coming to herself and looking around and talking. And But she's not talking to the people in the room. And all of a sudden, she just reaches up her arms and says, Is all this for me? And she was gone. I think that's what happened to her. I think that's what you see in here. Stephen's getting a glimpse because he's fixing to die. He looked up, and it says he saw the heaven open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. He'll become an important figure the further we get in the book of Acts and the rest of the word. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Stephen was calling upon God as they stoned him. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Lay not this sin to their charge. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that same Saul that was holding their clothes while they stoned him to death, he says something similar on down the line. Don't lay this charge against them. That's what happens when the Lord moves in and changes your heart. Hope he's done that for you. If not, there's still hope. 
but today's the sal the, the day uh, today's the day of salvation tomorrow might be gone for you god bless you i hope to see you there